Well, people run from God for two reasons. Really, only two reasons anybody runs from God. The first is fear. They're afraid of God's will for their life. They're afraid of what's going to happen if they submit to what God is calling them to do and to be about. They're afraid that their life is not going to be as much fun. They're afraid of the consequences. They're afraid of what people will say about them. They're afraid that, that what God has asked them to do is not going to be the most pleasant thing in their life. The other reason that people refuse to submit to God, they run from God, is because they're arrogant. They're arrogant. They think they know more than God does. Oh, I'm not going to submit to God's plan for my life because I know better than God does. I know better how to run my life. I know better about what I should do than God does. I know God says that, that marriage is sacred and divorce is a sin, but you know, I believe I'll be happier with this other person I met at work because the grass is greener on the other side. Oh, I, I know that God says that my body is a temple and I should not pollute it with drugs and alcohol, but you know, I'll be a whole lot more popular with my friends at school if I pop a few pills and, and drink a little with them. Well, I know that, that God wants me to go into missions or ministry, but you know, I got a different plan for my life and it's a, it's a better plan than God has. Folks, any of this sound familiar to anybody? Is this ringing any bells? Let me give you the theme of this book. The theme of this book, the book of Jonah, is you can run from God but you'll never get away from him. You can run from God, but you will never get away from him. Muhammad Ali was, uh, many years ago, was going to fight a, a, another opponent, a, a pretty highly ranked opponent, and the press came to him and they said, your opponent has said that you will never lay a glove on him because he will stay on his toes and he'll keep moving and he'll stay out of your reach. Muhammad Ali said, well, he can run, but he can't hide. <laughs> Folks, when it comes to God, you can run, but you can't hide. That is the message of the book of Jonah. Adam and Eve tried it. In the Garden of Eden, they tried to run from God, but they couldn't hide. It didn't work out for them. And Jonah's going to learn the same thing, and he's going to learn it the hard way. Jonah learned what we're going to learn over the next few weeks. Obedience to God brings blessings, and disobedience brings a burden. Now, how do we become a fugitive? How do we become a fugitive from God? Well, James Merritt says that there are four steps to becoming a fugitive. And I want to take those four steps this morning and apply them to Jonah and to our lives as well. And the first thing I want us to note is that the first step is that God makes demands on our lives. God makes certain demands on us. Jonah chapter 1 verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now the whole thing starts off pretty simply. God's word comes to Jonah. God's word always reflects God's will for your life. That's what the Bible's all about. God's will. God tells us what His will is for our lives. God's Word is very clear about certain issues. Now notice, God's Word to Jonah comes in the form of a command. Arise, go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh. He gives him a command. He tells him what he must do. Now there was a prominent local pastor not too long ago who, who preached that the Ten Commandments were not really commands. And I'm going to be charitable and say that he just misunderstood. Because the fact is, the Bible gives us commands. It is not the Ten Suggestions. It, it is not the Ten Sayings. It is the Ten Commandments. As a matter of fact, did you know that whenever God speaks to us in the Bible, in every case, every case when God speaks to us in the Bible, it is in the form of a command. God, God never comes to us with a, a suggestion. He never comes with us saying, you know, I'm going to give you a few options here. God gives us a command. 
it's always a command. He never wrings his hands and says, well, you know, uh, if you would like to do this, it sure would help me out. God is the king of the universe. He is the almighty, the sovereign Lord. And when he speaks to us, it is a command. It is an imperative. When God speaks, he means it. As a rule, God never gives us options. He never hedges his bet. When he says that uh, uh, believers should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, that's a command. He doesn't hedge his bet. He doesn't say, well, you know, if you're going to marry one, marry a good moral one. Find one that will go to church with you on Easter and Christmas. No, it's a command. It's a command. When God speaks to us, He speaks His will for us. He gives us commands that we are to submit to. It's the only live option. Submit to God. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to do that. Because a lot of times God will speak to us, and His will for us is not an easy thing for us to do. It's not easy for us to admit, submit to. Look at what God told Jonah to do. Verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now understand, Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And they are the sworn mortal enemies of Israel. They are, they are, are at odds with Israel. It would kind of be like uh, telling a Jew in 1943, we need you to go talk to Hitler and tell him that God loves him and has a wonderful plan for his life. Yeah, they're, they're enemies. And it's dangerous to do this. You know, the Ninevites, the Assyrians, were known for a few things. And one of the things they were known for was their cruelty and their torture. They would torture their, their prisoners of war to death. They would often bury them alive. Some believe that the, the Ninevites were the ones who actually invented uh, uh, crucifixion. They were brilliant at torture. And he tells Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach against them. Preach against them. Go into Nineveh. Walk into the enemy's camp and tell them you're doing wrong. Turn or burn. Now that's a dangerous thing to do. This is not an easy command that God has given Jonah. So uh, we can cut Jonah a little bit of slack in that God did not give him something easy to do here. Now God comes to us though and he gives us commands. And a lot of what he tells us isn't easy either. He tells us your neighbor is lost and needs to hear the gospel. You need to go talk to him. And our response is, Lord, I don't want to go talk to my neighbor. Lord says your best friend needs Jesus. You need to tell him about Christ. Well, I don't want to do that. He won't want to fish with me anymore. Lord comes to us and says, listen, in your business dealings, you need to be honest and upright in everything that you do. Well, Lord, I can't make any money doing that. God speaks to us. He doesn't always give us easy things to do and so what do we do we run in the other direction we do exactly the opposite of what he has called us to do God makes demands the second thing I want us to notice he leaves it up to us to decide to decide whether or not we are going to submit or not Fox News has a slogan we report you decide God makes demands of you you decide whether or not you're going to submit to them Every day we have to decide, am I going to do God's will today or not? God says, I love you enough that I am going to let you decide whether or not you're going to obey me. Now, if we look up the Lord and we say, Lord, this is going to be hard, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to submit to you. Then, then things are okay. We have a sense of God's presence with us. We'll have peace. We'll have His power in all that we do. But if we look at the Lord and we say, absolutely not. Lord, I'm drawing a line here. I'm not doing that. That's when the trouble begins. And that's what happened to Jonah. The first, uh, first few words here in, in verse 3 tell the story. 
But Jonah arose to flee. Jonah ran. Jonah bolted. You know, I read that, I can't help but think about when I was a little boy, and my mother took me to the, uh, the health department to get my, my shots, my, my inoculations. And I have a twin brother. And we got there, and they took my, ten, my twin brother first, you know. And I was okay with getting shots. I never really had a lot of shots, didn't know a lot about what was going to go on anyway. So we go in, and we're standing there, and they get my brother, and they take his arm, and they get a needle. And the needle was about that long. And they take it, and they stab him in the arm, and he goes, Ow! Well, I was ready for a lot of things, but I wasn't ready for ow. I turned around, and I bolted. Out the door, down the hall, I could see the doorway to the parking lot. I was home free. I was almost there, and this big old nurse steps out and grabs me and picks me up and puts me on the ground. They sat on me and gave me my shots right there in the hallway. To her dying day, my mother would tell you, the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to her. <laughs> but I felt like Jonah was like that. God said, go to Nineveh. Jonah said, I'm out of here. He bolted. He ran. He said, I'm getting out of here. I am not going to do this. Verse 3, Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare. He went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now you got to give him an E for effort here. Okay? Nineveh was 500 miles to the east of Israel. 500 miles to the east of Israel. He goes down to Joppa and gets on a boat that's headed to Tarshish, which was 2,500 miles to the west of Israel. He's literally going as far as you can possibly get from Nineveh. As a matter of fact, once you got past Tarshish, all you had was the Atlantic Ocean. As far as they knew back then, there was nothing beyond that. He is literally going as far as he can away from Nineveh. It'd be like God coming to you and saying, I want you to go to New York, and you get on a plane and go to Los Angeles instead. He is getting as far away from this, this city as he possibly can. He chooses rebellion over obedience. And let me point out, there are two major cities that are mentioned in this, this book. The first is Nineveh, and the second is Tarshish. And Nineveh, I'm going to suggest to you this morning, Nineveh represents obedience to God. And Tarshish represents rebellion against God. And every day when you get out of bed, you've got a choice to make. Am I going to dwell in Nineveh or am I going to dwell in Tarshish? Am I going to dwell in obedience to God or am I going to dwell in rebellion against Him? Every morning we get up, every minute of the day, we have a choice to make. Am I going to be obedient to God or am I going to go and visit Tarshish? Nineveh says, I'm going to be sexually pure because God says so. But Tarshish says, hey, everybody's doing it. Morals have changed. Get with the time. Nineveh says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Tarshish says, hey, it's just business. Everybody stretches the truth. Nineveh says, listen, I know my marriage is hard, but God says that as long as it's up to me, I'll stay married and I'll try to work it out. Tarshish says, hey, I met somebody that makes me a lot happier. God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? Every day we visit one of these two cities. Every day we decide whether we're going to dwell in Nineveh or Tarshish, obedience or disobedience. And folks, every time, every time you choose Tarshish over Nineveh, it's going to cost you. Look at Jonah. Jonah arose, verse 3, to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare. He paid to go to Tarshish. It cost him. The most expensive ticket you will ever buy will be a ticket to get away from God's presence, to get away from His will for your life. And look how easy it was. Look how easy it is. Yeah, I, I, I imagine Jonah goes down to Joppa, 
And he's only, he says, man, i got to get as far as I can from Nineveh. And he walks down there, and there's a ship that's going to Tarshish. And you know what he probably said? He said, the Lord has opened a door. Must be the Lord's will, because he provided. Folks, I want, to know, I want you to know something. Every time God calls you to Nineveh, the devil will provide a ship to Tarshish. Just because the door is open does not mean that it is God's will. An open door does not necessarily mean it's God's will. So Jonah gets on that ship and he sails and he thinks I've gotten away with it for a while. The ship actually sails. It, it actually sets sail. He goes down below decks. He lays down to take a nap. He thinks he's gotten away with it. And there is pleasure in sin for a season. I'll grant you that. For, for a season... It will seem pleasurable. It will seem like you've gotten away with it. But let me warn you folks, just because sin doesn't pay off every Friday night doesn't mean a payday's not coming. You remember the story of the prodigal son? The prodigal son came to his father and he said, Listen, give me my inheritance, what falls to me, so that I may go and spend it in riotous living. And So he takes what the father gives him and he goes and he has a party. And he parties for a while till the money runs out. And when the money runs out and his friends have left and he's hungry and there's nowhere to go, he winds up in a pig pen. Now he may have thought that for a while he was getting away with it, but folks, I want you to know something. The moment he left his daddy's porch, he was already headed for the pig pen. And the minute you decide that you're going to rebel against Almighty God, you're already headed for the pig pen. You never profit. You never profit in the long run, run when you decide that you are going to rebel against God. I, I have women sit in my office and tell me, Pastor, Pastor, why every man I meet seems to turn out to be a drunk? And I'll ask them, well, where do you meet them? Well, met them in the bar. Well, duh. When you decide you're going to rebel against God, you're already headed for the pig pen. God makes certain demands. We have to decide. And often we decide to disobey. Verse 3. Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. When you decide that you're going to rebel against God, it is going to be the most expensive trip of your life. Disobedience will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And it will cost you more than you wanted to pay. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you the day is going to come when you're going to look around and you're going to say, How did I get here? How did I get to this place? I never planned on, on following this law. I never planned on arriving in this situation. But it all happened. It all started when you decided, I'm going against God's will for my life. When you decide to disobey, you've already set a course for disaster. But fortunately, God loves us. And He loves us enough that God will discipline us. And that's the last point I want us to note. God disciplines us. Look at verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. Folks, it's a bad storm when the sailors are afraid. When the sailors get afraid, it's time to be afraid. It is a real bad storm when sailors start to pray. And let me tell you folks, it is a crisis when they start throwing the cargo overboard. You look around and the sailors are scared, you better be scared. Becky likes to tell a story about being on an airplane one time. She was flying up to, was it Fort Wayne, Indiana? She's flying up there one day. It's on one of these little, uh, uh, I think they charitably call them uh, uh, regional jets. It's a puddle jumper. You know. 
And she's on this thing, and, and they run through a thunderstorm, a terrible thunderstorm. The, the fastened seat belt light comes on, everybody has to sit down. And she's in the very front seat, and the only person in front of her is the stewardess who's sitting in a jump seat right in front of her. And the plane's bouncing around like a ping pong ball. And uh, she looks over, and the, the stewardess is white. And stewardess looks at her and says, I've never been on one that did this before. <laughs> when the stewardess is scared, it's time to be scared. When the sailors are scared, it's time to get scared. And they start praying to their gods. They start trying to, to do something to, to save themselves. They even throw the, the cargo overboard. And folks, they only got paid if they delivered the cargo. They're throwing their paychecks into the ocean at this point. Folks, when you run, when you run, you're not the only one that's going to get hurt. Just want you to know that. Runners always hurt the people around them. They always do. Good examples in divorce. You decide that you, you're just not going to stay married anymore. You walk out of that situation. You may think, well, I'm only hurting me, maybe my spouse. You're hurting your parents. You're hurting your family. You're hurting your church. You're hurting your community. You're hurting your children. I've had people tell me, oh, the kids will be better off if we get divorced. No, they won't. That's a lie from the devil. Every study that's ever been done shows that kids who are the product of divorce have a higher rate of every kind of social ill you can imagine as compared with parents who stay together, even if they're not happy. Kids still do better. When you decide you're going to run, other people get hurt. There's collateral damage all around you. You're going to take your spouse with you. You're going to take your family with you. You're going to take your church with you. You're going to take your community with you. Other people get hurt. Note that everybody here is praying except Jonah. Verse 6. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. He says, Jonah, get up and pray. The problem is, Jonah's not on the best terms with God. When you decide to run, it's going to hurt your spiritual life. When people come to me and they say, Pastor, I just don't have a, a, an assurance of my salvation. Or they come to me and they say, Pastor, I just don't have a sense of peace. I just don't have a sense of joy. I just don't have all these things you've been saying that should accompany my salvation. Now, there's a lot of reasons can be for that, but one of the reasons is that you're living in rebellion against God. And it's affecting your spiritual life. It's affecting your relationship with the Lord. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you won't lose your salvation. But David tells us in Psalm 51, you'll lose the joy of your salvation. You'll lose the sense of His presence. You'll lose the assurance of your salvation. Those things will get sucked right out of your life. Because you've chosen rebellion. You've chosen Tarshish over obedience to God. So the sailors, they sense that this thing is supernatural. This storm is not a natural storm. This thing's supernatural. So they cast lots to find out who is the problem, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now, folks, they could have cast lots a hundred times. Every time it would have fell on Jonah. People think that if God tells us to do something that Especially if we're a Christian. God comes to us and tells us, this is the way you're to do it. This is what you're to do. We, we, we get this idea that if we say no, God's going to say, well, okay, all right, I'll back off. I'll, just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with another plan somehow. It's not how it works. God is going to bring you into alignment with His will. He's going to do it one way or the other. One way or the other, you're going to submit to God, so you might as well go ahead and do it. God does not take no for an answer, especially from someone who is His. And it's not because God's interested in paying you back. That's not it. God's interested in bringing you back into right relationship with Him. So the sailors asked Jonah, What did you do to make this God so mad at you? Verse 8. They said to him, please tell us, for what cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, 
I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. This storm's getting worse by the minute. And they look at Jonah and they say, Listen, what can we do to stop this? What can we do to save ourselves? Now at this point, I firmly believe that if Jonah had said, Okay, God, I give up. I firmly believe that at this point, if Jonah had said, Listen, I'll go to Nineveh, just calm the sea, God would have done it. I think if he repented at this moment, God would have relented and let him go back to Joppa. But that's not what he does. Instead, he looks at the sailors and he says, Well, I guess you could throw me in the ocean. And they're like, Okay, jump. You know what he's saying here? He is saying, and maybe some of you are right here right now. Maybe this is where you're at. He is saying, Lord, I don't care if you kill me. I ain't going to Nineveh. That's what he's saying. Lord, I don't care what you do. I still am not going to Nineveh. I'm going to stand my ground. You can strike me dead, but I ain't going. And some of you are right there this morning. God has clearly made His will known to you and you are standing your ground and you're shaking your fist in His face and you're saying, I ain't doing it. I don't care what you do to me. I'm not going. Verse 12. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you for I know that this great tempest is because of me. I'd rather die than be obedient to God. Some of you kind of like a little four-year-old girl I heard about. Four years old, she got her first tricycle. She was thrilled. She had wheels for the first time. And her mama told her, said, well, you can play in the front yard, but don't go past the big tree at the edge of the yard. You don't get in the road. Don't go past the big tree. You just stay in the, in the front yard. And she says, but, 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 and mom said, no, no, no. If you go past the big tree, I will spank you. The little girl backed up to her mama, stuck her rear end up, said, well, go ahead and spank me because I got places to go. <laughs> Some of you like that with God. God, I got places to go. Do your worst. And that's what Jonah's doing here. Jonah says, listen, I'd rather die than be obedient to the Lord. Verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous around them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they pick up jo picked Jonah up here, and they threw him into the sea, it says. And what happens? The sea ceased from its raging. The sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Isn't that great? <laughs> you know what's going to happen? God's going to get glory and honor and praise. And it's going to be either through you or in spite of you. So you might as well submit. The only difference is what, how much you suffer in the process. God's still going to be glorified no matter what. Verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. What we're going to find out is that Jonah learned the same thing in the fish that he learned on the boat. That everywhere he goes, God is there already. God has been there the whole time. He ran from God to the, the ship at Joppa, and he found God on the boat. They threw him out of the boat into the ocean. He's swallowed by a fish, and he's going to find God's in the fish. God is everywhere we go. You cannot escape him. 